Good morning and welcome to another morning of GM Tips. This is GM Rick talking to you this morning from the La Casa, the home. Um, yeah, I mentioned putting both French and Spanish. Boy, you guys will have fun with me. <laughs> so, in this smiling day of days, I've got a new product to share with you. Ooh, and again, it's Pathfinder. See, one of these days, I'm going to get something like um, Tortured Earth and go through it or something else, and I will really impress you guys with something outside of my core, which is Pathfinder. But hey, the nice thing about Pathfinder for you D&Ders is this is convertible. It's really easy to port it from one to the other. So, that said... We are going to go into the campaign world again, keeping in the theme of the Inner Sea, which I brought up the last time with the Inner Sea World Guide. And we are going to go to Wes Schneider's creation. And actually, no, he was just tasked over it. There was a couple. I, first of all, let me give props to the people here. Wes Schneider headed it up as the author, but Amanda Kuntz always is a huge development lead in these things. And then the cover artist, Nicola, you did a great job. Nicola um, Matkovich did that. And then you have the interior artist with Leonardo Borazio, Marus Gand Ganzel. Boy, I'm going to kill some of your guys' names. Daniel Lopez, Damian Mamalodi. And then, uh, what is it? Chao Maciel Monterio, Robert uh, Peturu. And then uh, Mijo Quinto, and then Richard Suano, and uh, and then the creative director James Jacobs, and then also in there Rob McCreary and a few of the others. Um, so, yes, it is the path of the Hell Knight, and Wes, big props, my friend, big props. Uh, Definitely a great book. We've been waiting on this. I love that, as always, the inner covers has the well-known orders, and the back cover has the lesser-known orders. And let me just say, the Hell Knights are law on steroids in this world. They literally go at the powers of hell and test themselves for metal to bringing of law in the world. Now, the misconception a lot of people may have if they have never been in the game before, for those who have played for a while, they know this. Hell Knights are not necessarily lawful evil. They are not necessarily always, you know, bowing down to Hasmodeus and the, and the different, uh, like Mammon and the other ones who are all the rulers of hell. They're not. They are the law and order of the land. So, with that, we're going to take a very deep dive into the Path of the Hell Knight. But first, I want to go through the orders, because there's several orders that are there. In, in the, and they go through each of these and do a great job. The Order Without Mercy, it talks about just the order itself. And I love this cover insert here, because it really says it. You see the Hell Knights battling on the field. And basically, Hell Knights is a glance. You take a look at them. They look to you like some of the most evil creatures on Earth, but they're not. Um, Hell Knights, their whole purpose is to seek the embodiment of order, and they refuse to compromise on these ideals in any way, shape, or form. Now, there are a couple of the orders where some of the ones, like in uh, Hell's Vengeance and in Hell's... Um, Rebels, where you see a little bit of divergence in some of these knights, but otherwise they are pretty much bound to their codes. And they do everything to hold to these uh, philosophies uncompromisingly. So you take King Arthur's Order of Knights and put them into a very um, draconian way of doing things, and that's these guys. They will absolutely... Um, they do not fear much. The Hell Knights, most of them are lawful neutral. They're true law, not evil. There are some orders that are lawful evil. There are some of the, the Paralictors and stuff that are neutral evil as well. So there are some ones that vary a little bit off the scale, but for the most part, they are that way. They do not fear at all. They are the embodiment of bravery, and, and they stand up to things. And they go against um, the devils to test their metal. So a lot of them, when they're going through this order, and they'll, they'll tell you this, they summon, 
they basically go against a devil as a test to see if they're ready to f have that metal to survive in the worst of worst conditions to bring law to the land. And so, and they do the things on, some great things they do, the founding and the joining of the Hell Knights. And I will not spoil that for you, but basically it also gives you how to play a Hell Knight, which I love that. So you, you can embody that kind of order if you want to as a player. And it's a really neat thing. They give you the history. Oh, thank you, Wes. Um, we've been waiting on this. So it starts out right about um, the White Plague era in about 4573 AR, and it goes all the way up to 4716. So they've had about 200 years, maybe a little less, slightly less, but they're at about 200 years. And they go through the different ones. So the Hell Knights tenants, and they have the tenants of the Hell Knights. So you will see the tenants of them. And basically, the measure, um, it's basically the massive code of duties, laws, and crimes that these guys hold to. The chain, that's the philosophy of discipline of trial. And then in action, they strive to do both the measure and the chain in their life. And so, you know, you've got different names in there, and they go through which each is, the lictor or the general, the vicarious, the spell-casting general of that order, um, the master mistress of blades, which is a colonel, the uh, para vicar, which is the leader of the of the order's signifiers, which normally is an interesting rank. You see a lot of those. The paralictor, the high-ranking hell knight officer, similar to a major. The merilictor, which is the captain or the um, mid-level, uh, would be somewhat to a lieutenant. I'd say in some cases a captain, depending. Then you got the hell knight, the signifier, and the armager. And so they, the, they take you through what each of these terms are so you have a better understanding. They run you through the tests and the reckonings. So you get to see the actual tests and reckonings that these guys go through. And they talk about it here, which is great because we only have some alluding to that in, in different material on, um, on uh, the Cheliax Chel and, and some of the other things. They, they give a little bit of it. Now, the nice thing is... They give you the boons and everything else in each of the orders, which I really love that. They give the symbol. So in this case, the order of chain. There's a hand wrap around the chains for that order. They give you who the leaders, the members, the armor features are. Uh, the, the favorite weapon of that order. And then the reckoning. Um, you know, So you've got a lot of different things that they give you. They give you a, a deep dive, including where the citadel is for them. They, they mention the citadels as well as the prominent members. Uh, they talk about characters and NPCs. They give you some restraints. So on this page, you can see some of the different items. Uh, so they give you the iron mask and the manacles. Then they have the order of the gate. They go through that one. Again, beautiful artwork. Uh, they go through the Order of the God Claw. Now, that's an interesting one. That's five different gods of law that they all serve in that group. So I find that one kind of intriguing to me in, in their philosophies and thinkings. I love that. That just says it all right there. <laughs> tough, tough, tough guys. They give you the Order of the Nail. The Order of the Nail is interesting. And, and, and let me go through and I'll tell you a little bit about each one. So we'll do this. So what are each one standing for? The order of the chain. All lift themselves up upon the back of others. So we work together and you lift yourself upon the back of others. Order of the gate. Judgment in the face of depravity. They deal with the depraved and the, the chaotic and the neutral evil, really depraved people of the world. The order of the God claw. Righteousness is obedience. That is their tenant and the major thing that they stand behind. Uh, order of the Nail. Savagery must be quelled in land, home, and mind. They go out into the frontiers and they are, think of it this way. What do you do when a nail sticks up? You take a hammer and hammer it down. That's the order of the nail in a nutshell. Uh, 
So they're on a lot of the border frontiers. Again, love the different armors. Every order has different armors that are very different and unique from each other. The Order of the Pyre, Reason's Flame, consumes the shadow of corruption. So they deal with the corruption in governments, the corruption of officials, corruption in general. And they have the tower rising in the flames um, for their symbol. And again, Ruin Staunton's armor, a little bit different again. Each armor, some have spikes, some have weird curvy things, some have different epaulets. I love that they go through and make them each a little unique. Order of the Rack, the venoms of the mind poison the body. Um, so uncultivated minds that are just not cultivated a certain way cause the fall of and decay of society. So that's where the Order of the Rack comes in. All right. We're getting there, guys. The Order of the Scourge. Without culpability, chaos reigns. So, it says the powerful are not beyond reproach, and the rich cannot change the face of true justice, and head the nation, and the head of the nation is not the law. So, what they say is the law is the law, not the king or the queen. We deal with that in the Order of the Scourge. And I like their group. They're an interesting little bit of a different group. Then they have the lesser known orders, and there's some really fun ones. The Order of the Coil, to counter the poisons of the soul. The Order of the Crux, there is only vengeance. And those are basically, that's an order that got wiped out to the man, and they came back as undead, and they have their own machinations, and I love that. Order of the Glyph, truth for the deserving. Order of the Pike, the greater foes refuse to hide. Order of the Scar, every flame from the shadows guard. Order of the Torrent, breathe deeply before the plunge. In order of the Wall, a wall has no need for gates. So they go through those, and I really like that they do. You can get it in a minute. Hang on a second. So they go through the lesser known ones, and that's a good thing. Sorry about that. Mini GM knocked over her tower of baskets, so we had a meltdown. Those happen. Uh, the Hell Knight Arsenal, I love that they go through and give you the Inquisitions, the traits of them, as well as class options. You can do the different classes and what, what's what. They give you spells, a whole section. So the Brand of Conformity, the Brand of Hobbling, the Brand of Tracking, Infernal Challenger, and the Shackle. Uh, Hell Knight Feats, they give you some fun feats. So they give you Hell Knight Aegis. Hell Knight Obedience, Hell Knight Obsession, and Signifier Armor Training, which is good because you go from an Armager, which is the Squire, to the Signifier. And then the equipment. So you have a Branding Iron, the Hell Knight Barding for their um, horses, the Hell Knight Half Plate, the Hell Knight Leather, the Signifier's Mask. And so I like that they really just spent the time explaining the orders, explaining how they came about, explaining the philosophy. And if you've never played or, or um, GM'd a, an NPC Hell Knight, it's an experience. Do it justice. Really make it one of those role play, play it out, really bring out the power in those that order. They are a feared order on the face of Galeria. They are not some small little knight's clan that kind of goes around and does their thing or is a thorn in somebody's side. No, they are law-infused. They feel like they are bringing law to the lands. They feel like other lands don't have enough of it. Their knights have even gone into things like the Shining Crusade and going up and fighting Tarbafon, the Lich King when he was trying to take over Ustalav. They have marched forth in other crusades to try to quell injustice. People respect the Hell Knights. They don't always love them, but they respect them. When one of them shows up on a ship, that is a damning thing. That means you are in trouble when you have a Hell Knight leading a, a set of Marines. He is the literal bastion to which everybody comes around to, he or she. And don't ever think that they are not powerful, because they are. They are something to be feared and respected. 
And so this book will help you to do that. And it really does a great job in bringing out the richness of each of them. I love the artwork because up to then we haven't had a lot of artwork when it comes to it. So keep that in mind as you're looking at that. I think, you know, for anything, if, if anything, they are a major player in a lot of campaigns. And a lot of people in the Pathfinder side of things love the Cheliacs and the Chelish Empire just because of the sheer authority of the Thrun throne. And Abergrail Thrun is really a force to be reckoned with. And what her mother and grandmother set up is a power to yet be reckoned with. So just keep that in mind. Now, other things that you may want to keep in mind that have come out that are really good. And this one I haven't gone to, and, and I'm going to give you a double hit today with not just the orders of the Path of the Hell Knight, but Distant Shores. I have waited for Distant Shores for a long time. And I'll tell you why. Because it has a city in Arcadia that finally they give you a picture into Arcadia, one of the other realms, as well as Casmaron. So, uh, the cities that they, they really focus on on the distant shores, there's a couple of them. There is uh, Aeolosius, or Aeolosius, and it's the innermost archipelagos of Ib Iblidos. Iblidos. God, I'm just killing these names. This morning, mornings for me some days. I'm sorry, Paizo. I really am. I'm killing this. Um... It's, it's part of the islands that are in between uh, Garand and Kazmaron. And so just keep that in mind that these are places that are in between. They're almost like a Greek island because their gods are raised up or ascended mortals that protect those different islands. And they're also a fusion between humans and Cyclopeans. So the Golgons, are, some of them are there. They fled to these islands and they live in peace with one another. Uh, you have a newly in southern Garen, and that's a matriarchal city of uh, imperial lords that are down there. So for those of you that love the Azimar, there's your city right there. Uh, Ducharg, that's the uh, hobgoblin capital in Kaoling, which is the in the empire of Tianxia. And so that is an interesting city of all samurai style hobgoblins. Then you got Radrapal. Radrapal is on uh, Kazmaron. And, and they kind of give you a little map of this where everything is on these cities and which city is which with the flags. And I love that for each. Um, then you got Sagata. And Sagata is Arcadia's city. It's the gateway to Arcadia. And it's where both the um, Andorans and Chelish have come to make their way to the inner parts of the actual uh, island itself. Because there is a nice mountain range that is on the eastern shore that protects it. And then Ular Kel, which is in Kazmaron. And Ular Kel, think of, um, I don't want to say Xanadu, but almost like that. Think of the, the horse lords and... and uh, uh, Chinggis Khan and Kublai Khan and their cities. That's what this is. <laughs> and so Kazmon has horse lords, just like the human empires did. Now, they give you a little bit off the map, and, and they give you a little bit of background into each. I love that they have the gnome, our gnome Drudis, with the uh, the headdress of Ular Kel. Um, the cities are gorgeous. That's Alessius. And it's just a gorgeous city. Some of it is underwater, some of it is not. And it's a city that is known to be neutral good. It is a academic mythic sanctum. As you can see, some of it is flooded, some of it is not. Love the city. And it is a mythical oligarchy that rules it. And what you have is the chief myth speaker, Phimantar, which is a cyclops, neutral good cyclops, advanced cyclops. Dua Ilox, which is a merfolk. Uh, you've got an undying. And then you also have the hero god of the gardens and orchards, Calcasomades, and the hero god of seasons and spears, Someria. 
So you have a couple of those hero gods and goddesses that are there. And the society is a very Greek kind of philosophical society where both the Cyclopeans and the humans work together with the merfolk. There's one of the god men, Calxiomedes. And I'm probably killing these names, but I'm doing the best I can. And they even give you a little bit on the worship of these two. And they give you some weapons that you normally wouldn't have. And the weapons are the uh, Gastrophades, the Phaleros, and the Duru. And so you have some different things there. And what they do is they give you enough. Uh, they also give you first-tier champion path abilities for the Mythic and first-tier universals. So they give you some interesting mythical abilities in this as well, which I like that, especially when you're trying to go through towards the Mythics. And this is a Mythic realm. Um, there's a newly love the city of Anuli look. And uh, Anuli is in Holomog, which is one of the southern empires. And it is supposedly a celestial empire. And as you can see, they're based in a crater lake in that area. And that you have um, both lizard folk, Asimars, Ganzi, and humans all in that area. And so you have a lot of different mixes and notable people in both. So it's a great mix of people. Um, you have Captain of the Guard, which is a half-orc. And you have a lot of different people that are in the city. And it talks about the Holomog uh, clans and, and what happened. This is a Ganzi. They're an interesting race, and they have the Ganzi characters. And what they say, a Ganzi, it says, In every corner of creation, the raw chaos from which the world sprang gnaws to try to dra drag reality back into the madness that spawned it. The maelstrom extends its tendrils into the reality anywhere planar energies touch the material planes. And that's this. It's a Ganzi. A Ganzi is a chaotic, and they're kind of a chaotic creature outsider. And uh, so they are a unique offspring of that kind of chaos touching reality point. And they also give a goddess, Masluda, mother of the hearth and the wall. And that's some of what I like about this Distant Shores. They're starting to give you a peek into other Pathians. And that's fun. To me, I'm waiting for more gods and goddesses that can be worshipped. Uh, Dushard, oh yes. You can see this, the things that looks like a Oriental city, a Japanese city, but it is hobgoblins. And it's a city of conquerors. So here is its militant quarters. And it says, basically, and, and this is what they say in the beginning, like a well-oiled machine, the militaristic hobgoblin nation of Kowling churns uh, in an endless cycle of war, savagery, and hierarchical bureaucracy. And its engine is due... And, its engine is Dusharg, the nation's capital. Dusharg is a thriving urban center that places the hobgoblin's dominance, cruel social structure, and unwavering laws on full display. This is a militant, lawful, warlike city. It is the basically the Japanese warlords and Bushido code right here with the hobgoblins. So, for those of you that are tired of all human places, this is a fun place to run. And again, here's the warlord hobgoblin himself. And that is warlord Sung Sha Kavangaki. And he is the warlord there. But there are some humans. There is a human geisha. She runs things. Pertha Ramalin. And they give you the ranks, the military, the Shimujin, and the slaves. So there is order there. And then they give you the Onikin. So they give you a little bit on the Onikins. And as well as some stats on the different guards. Love the material. Again, lots of snapshots. So I can't wait till whole empires and worlds come out of these places. Radrapal. This is basically... I would liken Rajrapal to any of the Indian cities or even Pakistani cities of the ancient times. The Vudrani City of Arches acquired that epithet 
both for the prominent stone span under which any who travel the holy Matra River must pass, and for the extreme differences between the lifestyles of those who live on the opposite sides of the city's dividing ravine. And you can see the masses, the elite. And who is it ruled by? Dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Hmm. Mayor and Raja Lord Akashar, a Rakshasa. So yes, the city is ruled by a Rakshasa, even though the people are not fully aware of that. And there are so many gods and goddesses, it's, it's amazing. There are humans, Vanaras, Vishankyas, Tieflings, Rakshasas, and other. So there is a lot. And again, the silver surplus, they mine silver in the city. And this is Lord Akashar in his true form. He looks like a nice furry little creature, doesn't he? Until he kills you. <laughs> and it gives you sites of interest there, as well as the Vudrani caste. And it goes through the Vudrani caste system. So that's part of Kazmaron and understanding what the castes are and how they function. And they do have the castes called out in here. So that you understand that the castes have a working thing in the city. Uh, it's, it's basically the castes are the worker classes, the, um, the ruling classes, the war society, so the warriors are the, that, and as well as the clericals. And several gods and goddesses. Ashu Karma. Matravash and Omrataji. And again, the first is the Divine Divide, goddess of canyons, cliffs, gorges, and ravines. Makes sense in a city divided. Uh, Matravash, goddess of the Matra River. So she rules over the Matra River. Om, Omrataji is of silver, silver working and mining. So there's several cool things there. Hang on, I'll be right. So they give some things there with Kazmaron, and I like that, that they're giving you some flavors of the large empire. And as you know, there's a thousand gods and goddesses, so they're not going to be able to give us all. They have a god and goddess for everything, pretty much. But these are some of the majors. Now, here's what I've been waiting for. Sagata, the city of keys. And it is the city that is the key, and as you can see, the beautiful waterfall that is the key into Arcadia. And it says, from far across the Arcadian Ocean stands the vast continent of which the ocean takes its name, isolated geographically by seemingly endless waves and an untouched by foreign invasion. The people of Arcadia built a powerful empires, developed amazing feats of engineering, and made the most of their bountiful lands. Their isolation was not a curse, but rather a boon. But the people of Arcadia focused their resources inward towards their own communities. This is what probably Native America would have grown into had we left it alone. Uh, rather than warring each other, Arcadia itself is a land of towering mountains, broad prairies, lush forests, deadly deserts, and the various nations that fill the expanse have good reason to protect their bountiful land from those who would exploit it. Built high in a mountain pass just above the grinding coast, Sagata uh, serves as a gateway to the treasures and mysteries of the legendary region. Now, we do know that the Olfen did make a city north of there, where all of their Jarls go to die for their kings. So, we do know that. However, and that these two nations warred for a while until they came to a peaceful resolve, because this nation would have crushed the Ulthan eventually. But, because of that, they were able to come to a standstill. It is a gorgeous city, and it has both parts that are in the lower bowl and basin and the higher end. And it is a neat city. Um, it is a lawful neutral city of all things. Who would have thought Native Americans being lawful neutral? But that's what they've made this empire into. It is an autocracy, very insular, which makes sense. Um, and they have head investigators and councils. So, and they give some great names in there as well. Now, they are a mix of different people. So just keep that in mind as you think about and as you look at those things. There is a mix of people here. 
Uh, they have a mayor, Joaquina Awasul. And the mayor is a female human. So go figure. Now you can see. Could you say Incan, Mayan, and Native American? Absolutely. But in regal attire. And that's Joaquina Awasul, by the way, her picture. And then they have the bards. So they are an interesting people. They are much of the Native American kind of Mexico cast. They have the caprice of Kazatul. And Kazatul is a god that is over there, that watches over. And so they have the festivals for them that they give you for the power festivals. Um, so keep that in mind. They have a rich empire that has grown up in their own gods and goddesses. And they have the Sagata Protocol, which is how the four um, great nation came together to protect their lands. And uh, it came from the Avistani colonists that came over. Uh, so you have the the Mahwek people. The Mahwek, Mohawk, maybe. I don't know. Kind of interesting. Uh, but they did this accord at Sagata. And, or Sagata. and so you have several of the different ones that have come together and banded to make sure that this coalition of nations would be strong against the Far East. I like it because finally I can do some natives from there and bring them into Avistan. Because let's face it, would there be travelers and traders from there? Yes, there would be. Are they mentioned in any of the stuff in the inner sea? Not really. So I want there to be some presence. Now we do know that some of the polyglots, sound familiar, were taken as slaves over to by the Chelish, i.e. the British, and settled some cities over there for lumber. Hmm. Sound familiar? It just didn't succeed as well this time. Ular Kel. This is the water city of the horse lords, or the water lords as they call them here. The weary tra caravan driver, the grass sea of the central Kazmron, seems to go on forever. It's sighing yellow green waves, broken only by the dirt track of trade route. Yet, just when the supplies grow low and the mercenaries begin to mutter, a shape rises on the horizon. Domes and spires jutting from behind the gates, guarding the immense stone beast. This is Ular Kel, the caravan city, jewel of the steppe, and de facto capital of the nomad ruled Karaz. And so they have the water lords here who kind of run everything. And Ular Kel is a city of the water lords. It's a neutral city, has a council, and those are the different cons. Look at the water lord. Tell me if that doesn't look like, oh, I don't know, a conate person. <laughs> I love how they draw from this. Now, the Kara warriors look a little different, but it almost looks like the horse lords of Chinggis Khan. And look, a Mongol. Hmm. So maybe we are giving a little reverence to this. And I love that they do this. And they have the Iridian Fold which is the basically the Water Lords. They give you some different teamwork feats, the legacy of Sogus Tamri, um, which is the, the nations of that Kelishite realm. So they do give you some really neat things in here. Now, the props to the different people who wrote this. This one here was John Compton, Adam Daigle, Crystal Frazier, yay, Crystal, get your mention on here, Amanda, Eamon Coons, uh, Rob McCrary, Mark Moreland, James Souter, and Owen K.C. Stevens all were a part of authoring this. So keep that in mind. Sorry for the interruption. I get those with people delivering things. So every once in a while I get a knock on the door from something coming in from the factory. Uh, covered art, cover artist is Karem Bayet. And then the interior artists are Davi Blight, Tyler L. Edlin, um, Miguel, Re is it Regadon Harkness, Todor Christoph, 
uh, Jason Juta, Arena Kuzmina, uh, Michael Quinto, uh, Jason Rainville, Joe Wilson, and Ben Wooten. And then uh, the cartographer is Rob Lazaretti. So a great job by this bunch, and they really did a decent book. Both these books, now, the first one, the, the orders of the, the Path of Hell Knight, I give a 5 out of 5. No questions asked. Distant Shores, I actually will give you guys a 5 out of 5. I know I usually have given 4s, 3s, 4 and a half, but personally me, I love having more material to take and, and have players come out of different areas. So for me, that was a huge treat. Guys, some great material. One thing I know, some people gripe about money spent with Paizo and how much you spend for something new and this and that. Folks, if the material stuck, I wouldn't I would complain to high heaven for it. The overall quality of Paizo work is usually at least three and a half and up. So well worth the money spent, especially if you want to expand and grow what you're doing with your players and, and the whole realm. If you don't want to put in that money, then don't buy the campaign guide stuff. Just walk away. Uh, I think you're losing out on it, my opinion. But hey, you know, it's your choice. You can do whatever you want. You can play Pathfinder however you want. That's the nice thing about it. I'm a guy that loves the core material to death and I will continue to play it, run it, and have fun with it. And I love the fact that they're constantly coming up with new stuff. Keep up the great work, guys. Keep pumping the stuff out. Uh, don't don't pull off the accelerator at all. Uh, I, I think there's just too much that needs to be written that for you guys to ever stop accelerating. And I think it will continue to be a major, major treat to see each of these things come out. Thanks again to everybody who did this work. I hope uh, you guys enjoy my review of this. hope it makes you want to go out and buy it and utilize it. That's the key. And uh, we'll talk to you next time.